Whatever you might be told, life is cheap inside the animal laboratory. You what? That's dead. That mouse is dead. You won't get up. <laughs> you break its neck, but that's dead. What is it dead off though? What have you done to it? Completely matched its f***ing head in. Officially, nearly three million animals die in experiments in British laboratories every year. However, data collected from the inside by the National Anti-Vivisection Society shows that for every animal used, another two have died because they are simply surplus to requirements. Some four million more animals than officially recorded. Laboratory staff have even admitted that they kill animals to reduce numbers for the Christmas holiday, when there will be less staff available. When life has so little value, it's hard to believe that animals are only ever used as they claim when absolutely necessary. Bland government assurances that our legislation is the best in the world do not convince a public familiar with video and photographic evidence of the reality of animal experimentation. And the secrecy with which the law is administered only hardens the conviction that there is something to hide. It is hard to find another industry which generates so much public concern, yet is so manifestly unaccountable. Public concern is swept aside by vague reassurances that animal experimenters must adhere to strict guidelines and that animals are only ever used when absolutely necessary. But a decade of investigation by the National Anti-Vivisection Society, the NAVS, shows that the law simply isn't working the public have been duped. Whilst animal laboratories remain shrouded in secrecy, cruel and unnecessary experiments will continue unchallenged and public debate will be stifled. It is time animal experimentation was put to the test. Even the current weak guidelines on lab animal welfare, spelt out in the Code of Practice for the Housing and Care of Laboratory Animals, are either ineffectual or routinely ignored. Consequently, the majority of laboratory animals spend their lives stacked in cages little bigger than shoeboxes. There is little or nothing to amuse the animals. Accommodation is designed purely for convenience. How could the researcher responsible for this even imagine it was acceptable to keep so many animals in such a tiny box? A minor and common accident. The water bottle has flooded a mouse cage. The mice are wet and cold. What bedding they have is soaking. Often such animals will not survive. Rodents are even mutilated to make identification easy. Without anaesthetic, toes or tips of tails are snipped off with scissors or holes are punched through ears. For some species, official guidelines are a little more detailed. For dogs, it is said that bedding and nesting materials should be provided unless it is clearly inappropriate. In over 10 years studying UK laboratories, the NAVS is yet to find a laboratory that provides its dogs with bedding. Certainly not this one, Smith Klein Beecham, nor this one. Charing Cross and Westminster Medical School in London. Nor this one, Toxical Laboratories in Herefordshire. Not even at this licensed laboratory animal dealer, Harlan Interfauna in Cambridgeshire. Although rudimentary, there are more guidelines under the code of practice for the housing of primates than any other species. Yet for these monkeys at St Mary's Hospital Medical School, almost every guideline was ignored. When the NAVS revealed this, the Home Office promised to act. Yet two years later, and just a few miles away at the Institute of Neurology, 
we found these monkeys. Alone in small cages, no dimensions measuring more than a few feet, no bedding, no foraging materials, virtually no furniture and harsh metal grid floors. Little wonder this poor monkey named Alice has gone out of her mind. The Institute claimed her injuries were from cage mates at the laboratory that sold her and that she had arrived in this disturbed state of mind. But she had been sold to the Institute by another British laboratory, Cambridge University. It is said that licenses to experiment on animals are only awarded to establishments which meet the guidelines in the code of practice. Clearly, the Home Office allows exceptions. Experimenters routinely claim that animals in UK laboratories come from licensed suppliers. Yet in a year, over a thousand animals may come from non-licensed sources or are supplied by middlemen. And what faith should we have in those establishments with a Home Office stamp of approval? In the face of public concern, the use of wild-caught primates in UK laboratories was banned unless the researcher can convince the Home Office that the use of wild primates is necessary. Consequently, baboons have been snatched from the wild and used in experiments. Was there an important scientific reason for this? No. There were simply not enough captive bred animals available at the time. These groundhogs once ran free. They were trapped in the USA and shipped to these miserable cages in a UK laboratory. The code of practice states, animals caught in the wild should be kept in conditions which conform as nearly as possible to their natural habitat in such respects as light intensities, food, etc. No evidence of compliance here. The cages speak for themselves. So where is the evidence of these so-called rigorous controls. Elisa has a steel headpiece, tubes and electrodes permanently bolted into her head as part of a lengthy experiment to trace the connections between the brain and hand. This kind of research has been strongly criticized by scientists in this country and abroad. And the way the monkey is being kept breaches the government's code of practice on housing. The researcher responsible approached the Home Office for a five-year license, which would allow him to use 61 monkeys, 25 rats and four cats in a variety of procedures. The Home Office awarded this license in just three working days. The Home Office subsequently claimed that discussions had taken place prior to the application but there is no access to any evidence of this, nor access to the reason for awarding such a license. Again and again, the National Anti-Vivisection Society has shown experiments which are unreliable, unethical and unnecessary. A single example should call the system into question, yet the list seems endless. Often so great are the differences between ourselves and other animals, the diseases simply cannot be replicated, so a bizarre approximation may be used instead. Here, air has been injected behind the shoulder blades and an irritant added to cause inflammation in an attempt to mimic arthritis. Yet even the researcher at St. Bartholomew's Hospital Medical School conceded, it is possible that the mechanisms that produce the air pouch and arthritis are not the same. At Charing Cross and Westminster Medical School, this dog has had a pacemaker fitted to induce heart failure. The dogs in these experiments suffer swollen abdomens and paws, loss of appetite and fluid-filled lungs. Yet the results even differ between breeds of dog, let alone attempting to extrapolate them to humans. This is a multiple sclerosis experiment, but the animals do not have multiple sclerosis. They have a laboratory manufactured disease known as EAE, even though there are crucial differences between this and human multiple sclerosis. The rat is recognized as a poor model for human epilepsy, but that didn't save this one at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School. Even worse, 
the type of drugs being studied, were already known to give different reactions between rats and monkeys. Which results might the researchers attempt to apply to people? Probably neither. Animals are often used when a non-animal method is clearly available and is actually more relevant to humans. Cancers are grown on the backs of rodents when human cancers are being studied in cell culture elsewhere. These monkeys were injected with excrement from other monkeys infected with hepatitis, yet human hepatitis can be studied in cell culture. Animals are used in experiments when the outcome is already known, when products have already been tested on animals or have been used extensively by people. Beagle pup is it toxical, a commercial contract testing laboratory were force-fed a weed killer that had already been tested on animals and had been on the market for 20 years. These sheep are part of an ongoing series of projects at Oxford University, studying a pump designed to assist the heart after injury. The researcher responsible for the pump had already conducted similar experiments in the USA, and similar pumps are already in use amongst people. Over 50 sheep had already been used. Some had open and infected wounds. Others broke plates in their heads, head-butting the walls. The researchers described some of this suffering as a learning curve. The active ingredient of an anti-malaria drug was being tested on these dogs at Toxicol, even though it had been given to over a million patients with remarkably few adverse effects. These rats were being used in an arthritis experiment at St. Bart's, which was acknowledged by the Home Office as causing substantial pain. The drug being tested was already being used by people. Cats, here at the Institute of Neurology, were used as part of a migraine experiment, examining a theory that was discredited in humans ten years earlier, after a 30-year clinical study involving a thousand patients. It is not mere accident that this work is allowed to continue unquestioned. The law as it stands ensures secrecy and blocks scientific debate. The NAVS believes that animal experiments are fundamentally flawed, that medical progress is not reliant on animal research, indeed that animal experiments are misleading and have even delayed medical advances. We are prepared to put this to the test. Animal researchers are always the first to say that animals are only ever used in research when absolutely necessary. We want to see this claim finally put to the test. There has to be freedom of information about animal experiments if we are ever to see the end of this needless research. The National Anti-Vivisection Society proposes that there should be a mechanism by which unnecessary or repetitive experiments can be challenged on scientific grounds before they take place. Surely only the widest possible scientific consultation befits a proposal to deliberately inflict pain and suffering on an animal. After all, such infliction of suffering would in other circumstances be illegal and render the person responsible liable for prosecution. One might expect that this license to act outside the laws governing the rest of us would necessitate greater accountability. In fact, for the animal researcher, it means even less. Just remember, everything you have seen in this video was licensed and inspected by the Home Office. And yet even your Member of Parliament would not have known about it, but for the National Anti-Vivisection Society. It is surely time to unlock the labs. Thank you.